Um, so thank you so much for everyone for coming. My name is Meredith Hanley. I'm our Director of Development here at New America. So welcome Monday night. Love that y'all are here for this. Um, we host a lot of important policy and practice discussions um, about a myriad of tech issues and education and better life and political reform and not so much on the larger ecosystem of nonprofits and uh, policy and practice. And so I'm, this is sort of my fun hobby um, because we live it here, everyone lives it here. Um, but I'm really happy we're doing this event tonight uh, with Kathleen Kelly Janis um, about her new book, Social Startup Success. This is what I would call um, an active reading book. So work with me here. Uh, does anyone ever open up a book and then you realize very quickly that you need your highlighter and those little tabby things that sip on the edges and then like a nice color pen where you can write things in the margins? Um, this is that book for me at least where you open it up and then you realize also too after you've assembled those little bits, um, that you also need to start a separate um, reading list. So I've chucked my New Year's um, must-read list, and now I've assembled a whole new reading list based on the little gems that uh, Kathleen has put in this book. So I'm hoping you'll be as inspired um, to read this as I was to, to get through it. So Kathleen um, is the author of Social Startup Success, How the Best Nonprofits Launch, Scale Up, and Make a Difference. This is particularly interesting to have this conversation here at New America because we have evolved um, from your, uh, as traditional as New America ever was, think tank to um, a national networked model. And so we are living this, these concepts of uh, scaling and sharing ideas and people and, um, and work across the US. Kathleen herself is a social entrepreneur, a writer and a lecturer at Stanford's program on social entrepreneurship. She's an expert on philanthropy, millennial engagement, and scaling early stage organizations. As an attorney, she spearheaded numerous social justice initiatives. And this book, as I said, stands out amongst the rest. She spent the last five years traveling across the country, visiting founders and leadership teams, funders, and dozens of social entrepreneurs, detailing findings and details about best practices. So in this book are about testing ideas and measuring impact, funding experimentation, which is my personal favorite, and leading collectively. She is joined today by our fearless leader at New America, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is the president and CEO, and the Bert G. Kerstetter University Professor Emerita of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton. Anne-Marie joined New America five years ago. This is your fifth anniversary. Well, four and a half, 2018. I'm projecting a little bit. <laughs> Um, four and a half years ago, uh, from her time at Princeton, from 2009 to 2011, she also served as the Director of Policy Planning for the United States Department of State, the first woman to ever hold that position. And prior to her government service, Anne-Marie was the Dean of Woodrow Wilson's, um, the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. She's written or edited several books of her own, her most recent success, also about networks, the chessboard and the web, Strategies of Connection in a Networked World. She is joined by another wonderful New America pillar here, Cecilia Munoz, our Vice President of Policy and Technology, and the Director of New America's National Network. Prior to joining New America in 2017, she served on President Obama's senior staff, first as Director of Intergovernmental Affairs for three years, followed by five years as the Director of Domestic Policy Council. So when it comes to working with nonprofits, understanding how to scale them, and then implementation, these two ladies have it all wrapped up. <laughs> Prior to her work in government, she served for 20 years at the National Council of La Raza, the nation's largest Hispanic policy and advocacy organization, where she was Senior Vice President for the Office of Research, Advocacy, and Legislation. So please welcome Kathleen to the stage. She'll tell us a little bit about her book and have a really good conversation with these three wonderful ladies. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Meredith, and thank you, Anne-Marie and Cecilia and everyone at New America for having me. It's so great to be on week three of the Social Startup Success Epic Book Tour. <laughs> um, you know, I, it's exciting for me to be in D.C. personally. I started here back in high school as a congressional page, and a couple of my <laughs> page <laughs> friends are here. <laughs> um, and so really, you know, that was where my social change career began in a way, this is really coming full circle for me. Um, 
So I'm on week three of the book tour, and the, the question that I get asked the most, it seems, is why on earth did you decide to write a book during the same time that you had three children in three years? <laughs> I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a two-year-old. And I can tell you I answer always the same, and looking out to see so many policymakers, nonprofit professionals, you know, people who are making a difference in this world, we all care about social change because this work matters. Everyone in this room, in one way or another, is doing their part to help make the world a better place. And what's exciting is that we have seen a groundswell in innovation over the past couple of decades, whether it's new forms of philanthropy or new ways of applying innovation to nonprofit work. And that's a good thing because there's no pro shortage of problems that we must solve in this world, whether it's climate change or increasing inequality or racial injustice issues. The problem is that not all nonprofit organizations are created equally, that having a good idea or good intentions is simply not enough to assure that an organization will achieve impact. And I thought I would start this conversation with a story that really embodies the reason why I wrote Social Startup Success. And it's the story of a former Stanford student, Rob Gittin, who, like many of my students, selected his class schedule based on classes that met afternoon because he <laughs> liked to sleep late. <laughs> and so he stumbled into this class called Homelessness in America, and he and fell in love immediately with the kids that he was working with. He was volunteering with homeless youth in San Jose, and he um, found this passion in helping to connect these kids and rebuild trust where these kids had been left uh, at every single stage of their development behind by the criminal justice system, by the foster care system, by their parents, by government. And so when he graduated, he need, needed to figure out a way to continue working with these kids. And so he wrote his Echoing Green application to get seed funding for his work. He started an organization in San Francisco called At the Crossroads, and he was off. He spent 24 hours a day, practically, <laughs> from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. every single night doing outreach with homeless youth in San Francisco. And he quickly realized that he was only going to make a small dent in the problem, that he alone was not going to be able to help all of the children that needed his help in San Francisco, and that if he wanted to make a difference, he was going to need to scale his organization. But he was 22, and he had never been hired before, let alone hired anyone else himself. He had no connections to high net worth individuals to help him fund this organization that he wanted to start, and he didn't know where to begin to measure the impact of the work that he was doing to see if he was on track to achieving his goals. This is the story of so many social entrepreneurs and early stage nonprofit professionals. And I know this story well because it was my story too. When I was a young lawyer in San Francisco, I spent my days billing hours at the law firm and my nights co-founding Spark, an organization that engages young professionals in new forms of gender equality, uh, new forms of philanthropy to support gender equality. And it was amazing. We had a ton of buzz. We had lines around the block for our events. We were doubling our revenue every few months. And then, like two-thirds of nonprofits in the United States, we hit a wall at $500,000 in revenue. We couldn't get past that wall to get the money that we needed to scale our impact. I became really curious. Who are the organizations that are getting past that wall and what are they doing differently that we obviously were not doing at Spark? And so for the past five years, I have traveled the country surveying hundreds of social entrepreneurs, their staff, their beneficiaries, their funders, all to get to the bottom of this single question. Why is it that some organizations succeed and scale and others don't? And so put simply, social startup success is the playbook that I wish I had when I co-founded Spark. It's the playbook that my Stanford students have been asking me for for years. It's an insider's look at the five best practices that I talk about in the book about how organizations scale. 
And I hope that readers will come away from reading Social Startup Success with a strong sense of what it takes to make a difference in the world. The problems that we're facing are huge. And as Bill Drayton, the founder of Ashoka, is fond of saying, it's no longer enough to just give a man a fish or even teach a man a fish. We need to revolutionize the fishing industry. That's what social entrepreneurs are doing. They're not just satisfied giving a homeless person a bed or a meal. They want to solve the underlying problems that are resulting in homelessness in the first place. Social entrepreneurs and small nonprofits are also critical to policymakers because they're testing ideas in small and nimble ways that government never could. They're the incubation arm for government. Take, for example, Alan Casey and Michael Brown, who had this idea when they graduated from Harvard Law School to start City Year to engage young people in service. That idea was so effective, it caught the eye of Bill Clinton and became enacted as AmeriCorps, which has served uh, a million young people and who have contributed 1.4 billion hours of service in this country. Another example that I talk about in Social Startup Success is Ellen Moyer, who founded the New Teacher Center because she saw her students graduating from the University of Santa Cruz from the Department of Education and dropping out as first year teachers because they couldn't handle it. And so she started this mentoring group on a small scale, pairing her first year teachers with mentors. And the program was so successful that the state of California adopted it as mandatory policy. And just last year alone, New Teacher Center mentored 40,000 new teachers in the state of California, increasing teacher retention uh, uh, by 30%. So these are really critical ideas that came from, everybody has to start somewhere. Um, and as I think about what I hope social startup success will do is what if we provided Alan Casey or Ellen Moyer or the next generation of Ellen, Alan Moyer and Alan Casey's with the tools that they needed to break through that revenue wall sooner so that people like Rob Gittin, who has take, taken 20 years to scale his organization at the crossroads, can work through that much more quickly. I, don't, I just don't think that we have 20 years to waste. And so I'm excited to use this book to help maximize the resources that we have in an already starved sector and to hopefully help maximize our, all of our collective potential to make social change. So it's, it's not often that I get to moderate a panel where, where all of us have such a direct stake in what you're talking about. As you were talking about the $500,000 wall, which is getting from you know, zero to enough scale to have a couple of people and start doing things, I was thinking that about a year into this job, I was talking to uh, a friend uh, who has spent years working with nonprofits in different ways, who just said to me that the journey from 20 million to 50 million, so much bigger than what you're talking about, but nevertheless, is the valley of shadow. <laughs> and, I, and it's a similar point. You can get, you get, there are these, these milestones where you get big enough to do something, but how do you, how do you just keep growing? And above all, not just keep growing for the sake of it, but keep growing so that you can maximize your impact, which, which is uh, what's, so, what's so important. Uh, so I've got many questions uh, for, for, and Cecilia has, has seen this both from her government portfolio, but also from 20 years uh, in the business. I guess the, the start with, it, it's, it doesn't seem accidental to me that you have a new book called The Social Startup, which is not language that Washington typically uses, and that you are from the other coast. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to ask, to what extent do you think Silicon Valley and what you might call the new philanthropy uh, is, has influenced this model and or is even responsible for it? And is there a way, you know, if that, to the, to the extent that's true, how do you transfer it to older models of uh, here, think tanks, 
or NGOs or charities, all the terms we traditionally use for organizations working in the public good? We like to use the word disruption a lot in Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that there has been an enormous disruption in the social sector um, in our region and across the country, really, um, that has started with these early stage organizations, often funded by donors who want to see things run differently and who are excited by new ideas and new approaches such as a really strong approach to uh, tracking metrics and, and, and looking at impact in data-driven ways to determine whether we are really actually on the path to making impact, um, to looking for more sustainable sources of income and trying to figure out how we can make our nonprofits less reliant on philanthropy so that they can eventually be more sustainable in the long run. So I think that all of those trends are really exciting. I think they also have their limitations. And so I think that what's great about sitting on the sidelines on the other coast maybe is that you can draw from the best of what um, these new trends are, are showing and proving and, um, and, and implement those strategies in any organization. Yeah. Okay, so you saw this in government. You saw the California impact on government. Yes. <laughs> Well, and I think one of the challenges um, that connects to what you were just saying is that there are, you know, drawing on my years even before government, there are organizations, institutions, folks, this has come into being. I consider myself as someone who comes from the civil rights community that, um, that have deep knowledge about a particular set of problems and challenges and don't necessarily have access to some of the tools that you're talking about. I mean, part of what we're working on here at New America focuses on tech and helping empower those kinds of organizations with sort of not just tech tools, but tech thinking. But we have this challenge where I think there are uh, organizations which, have been, which are doing good and important things, but they're using the same toolbox that they've been using for the last 30 years or, the, or longer, um, as well as this sort of wave of, of entrepreneurship. And the, one of the challenges is how do you make sure each of these informs the other. Mm -hmm. That I worry a little bit about each side not quite knowing what they don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the areas we're, we're working in here, which is, a, which is a challenge, is trying to create tables where you have this sort of deep knowledge about the African American community or the Latino community or whoever it is at the table with folks who are innovating and how they tackle and applying a new skill set and how they tackle problems and making sure each is informed by the other mm -hmm. when e they don't start from the perspective of believing that there's value at being at the table with folks, the folks who are on the other side of the table, if yeah. that makes sense. As a, as a follow-up and we'll let you respond, what do you do with people who don't want to be disrupted? I mean, the whole, you know, the California uh, sort of zeitgeist is disruption is good. That is not often, the certainly not the response of bureaucrats, but often not of communities or of community organizations who see their livelihood uh, in the traditional way they've been doing things being disrupted. Well, there will always be a very important place for community-based organizations. And although two-thirds of the nonprofits in the United States are $500,000 and below in revenue, mm -hmm. and for many organizations that is simply not enough to survive, and they need more capital to get off that treadmill because we have great ideas dying on the vine because they can't get funded. Mm -hmm. There are also many organizations for whom $300,000 is plenty of money to run a great organization in a community. I'm from a small town in Napa, California, and we have many community-based organizations that are doing very important work that should not scale and should not disrupt, but can learn to modernize based on new practices and tools and strategies that have been proven to make organizations more efficient and more effective and that ultimately funders are gonna be looking for. And so if you don't jump on the bandwagon, you're not gonna get funded. Yeah. So, one of the, the best practices for nonprofits, and you talk about it, uh, and, and I've seen it in other places, is monetize your assets. Figure out, uh, you just said, how can you be sustainable? And all of us in this room have had the experience of 
you know, uh, philanthropists, do individual donors, foundations saying, we'll give you the seed money and then you'll figure out how to make it go of its own accord. And often when that grant runs out, the bicycle falls over because there's no way to make it uh, sustainable. But the, the question I have is, how do you, you know, if you're just pursuing sustainability, doesn't that often skew your mission? It's, isn't it like a startup that says, you know, Twitter started out selling one thing and then discovered that product didn't work, but this one was really working very well, and they, so they, they switched to what they could sell, but that's a very different proposition than the nonprofit world. You can't just go where the money is. Well, this is a really big problem, is that philanthropy in many ways has swung too far in the other direction, that philanthropy is expecting that nonprofits will become more sustainable without really fully recognizing the challenges that come with mission drift and separating from your mission when you are pursuing profit. Yeah. And I think we have to recognize as a sector that there will always be a role for philanthropy to play. If it were profitable to bring <laughs> clean water to, Coca to Africa, Coca-Cola probably would have done that a long time ago. Um, so we can't use market solutions where we were solving problems that have been created by market failures. Um, on the flip side of that, every organization needs to figure out the right funding model that works for them. And so there are circumstances where an organization could be fully sustainable, but maybe philanthropy could help enhance their mission. So for example, Hot Bread Kitchen hmm. is a, a nonprofit in Harlem that is doing amazing work training low-income women to go into jobs in the food industry. When Jessamine Rodriguez started the organization, she thought, I'm going to be fully sustainable. We're going um, we're gonna, to we're gonna fund the programs for the training the women with the bread sales and wholesale. that They sell bread to Whole Foods and to JetBlue and with uh, income from this incubator that they run. Well, first of all, I was on stage with Jessamine the other night, and she said if she had it all over again, she never would have chosen bread because she didn't realize the profit margins were like this big. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, pest control or laundry would have been a much better choice. Um, but second of all, she realized very quickly that she was selling her programs short by only going after profits. That in fact, by increasing her philanthropic income, she could enhance the programs by, for example, providing childcare for the women while they were in the program, um, or hmm. keeping the women longer in the program than might be profitable. So I think that what's critical is that every organization figure out what level of sustainability is appropriate for their mission and for their organization, um, and, and, and push back on funders when they ask those hard questions. Some organizations will never have any form of earned income. Accountability Council, which is represented here tonight, <laughs> I'm on the board of, of this human rights organization. We're fighting for people's human rights. They will never pay us for, <laughs> their, for that representation. And that's OK. And that is still an important role for us to play. But philanthropy is going to have to fully sustain our work. <laughs> that's yep. fair, fair enough. And it, but it's a. Um, it's a tremendous challenge, and there, you're right that the sort of direction that the conversation is going in, to a certain extent, is undercutting the notion that that there is good work to be done that is never that just isn't going to be able to find a way to be sustainable. That that and that is a reality that I think we need to recognize, and that it, the sources of philanthropy and the extent to which people are engaged in contributing to these kinds of solutions is another thing which has to expand, and part of our challenge is something that we think about here is making sure we're engaging in storytelling about what um, local innovators are accomplishing so that people um, regain the sense of agency that we actually have the capacity to solve our, mm -hmm. to, to collectively solve our problems and address them because that's in, in part one how you infuse a sense of hope into a fairly cynical time but it's also how you get people connected in contributing either as volunteers or with their resources in to making sure that these programs run. Mm -hmm. Have you seen successful social startups using crowdfunding? Speaking of expanding the range of donors. It is one form of funding. It is 
not an easy form of funding. Okay. That's why I'm asking <laughs> if, uh, how um, successful have you seen anybody you know, and again, succeed? It depends, it depends on the model. Charity Water is an example of an organization that has decided from the very beginning that they were going to capitalize on the 43% of donors in this country that don't trust charity. We're going to get them by showing them exactly where their dollars are going. And for them, crowdfunding has been really successful because they have been using these really creative strategies like donate $26 for your 26th birthday in lieu of gifts and getting all your friends on Facebook to do the same. And um, by knowing who their audience was and what was going to be the most effective fundraising strategy with that audience, they have been able to crowdsource. Now, they also raise tens of millions of dollars at their annual <laughs> gala every year <laughs> to compensate. So. And that's a very traditional way of, <laughs> of, uh, of, of raising money. Um, let's uh, talk, shift and talk about uh, leaders a little bit. And you, there's a section uh, in, in Social Startup Success on leadership that I thought was just terrific. Uh, and and very, again, very, very concrete. Uh, but I hear this, uh, and, and you write about it, that funders complain that they're, they're not enough effective leaders and effective organizations by which they mean sustainable and using uh, sort of new practices. Um, but at the same time, we all know many, many social entrepreneurs, and I would just say nonprofit leaders, who complain, we've got the leadership, we just don't have enough places to pitch. In other words, I often think if I could make, it, it, turn New America or any of our organizations into a uh, social enterprise, I could pitch lots more people who have, have pools of money. How do you, how do you bring those together? The sort of complaint that they're not enough effective leaders and lots and lots of leaders who say, give me a chance to show you that I'm effective, but don't seem to be able to get in the door. Leadership in the nonprofit sector is a challenge because it, it, the jobs pay less. I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Less money, more meaning. <laughs> <laughs> um, in Silicon Valley, we see this a lot where we're, you know, nonprofit, the nonprofit sector is competing with the tech sector for um, talent. And, you know, especially with technology jobs and um, tech nonprofits in particular, they find it very challenging to, to compete for um, that talent. On the other hand, you know, as I see with my students at Stanford, there's no shortage of super talented young people who are mission driven and want to go into this sector. And I think as a sector, it's our obligation to infuse capacity building and management training and all of the things that have become commonplace in the for-profit sector um, that nobody's born a manager. These are tried and true strategies that you learn <laughs> by doing and by being trained and mentored by people who have done it before you. So I would say 90% of the people that I interviewed from this for this book had a management coach. And that's great. We should talk about that because it's not cheap, it's, it's, but it's an investment because leadership turnovers are expensive. And so there's no reason why we shouldn't be investing in that. The and were ninety percent? That's a really striking number. And were, did their donors pay for that? Absolutely, absolutely. It's becoming more common for funders, in particular, for foundations to um, to to offer that as a part of their grant making process. I used, to, I used yep. to joke with fellow leaders in the sector that I worked in that the. The management piece was in the category of like not the reason you went into this work. Like nobody, <laughs> not a lot of people lead a nonprofit because they wanted to go into nonprofit management, right? It's a set of skills you learn because you want to deal with homelessness or you want to, right, do good work for the world. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like in again in the um, startup context that there is a um, a theory of the case that the the person, the entrepreneur who starts a company isn't necessarily the person who should be managing a company once it's off the ground, right? Mm -hmm. We assume that when, mm -hmm. with respect to a, to a company, to an entrepreneur. And we don't necessarily make that assumption with social entrepreneurs. And I think one of the big, big challenges of the nonprofit sector is that the, the, you know, the innovators who come up with ways to solve problems or who build institutions to tackle problems don't start out necessarily being best suited to, be, to manage organizations. It's not 
kind of why you go into this work. Some turn out to be really talented at it, some don't. And but it is hard um, to build a management structure where you bifurcate those things and you have the charismatic leader do the charismatic leader thing, and you yes. know, with a, with somebody who's doing the day to day management. Um, it's a classic classic problem in the nonprofit sector, and we're not applying the same wisdom to that sector that we're applying to other kinds of entrepreneurs. It's even worse in the uh, thinking part of the nonprofit sector, mm -hmm. think tanks and universities where I spent most of my career. It's a, for people who cho choose that life uh, generally prefer books to people. Right? That is exactly why you go into something that lets you spend most of your time with books or now screens. So that it is affirmatively at the opposite end of, of what makes a, a good manager. Well, it's interesting that donors will pay for that. One of our donors is actually funding uh, consulting on change management, which is like coaching an organization, not coaching a person, which I think is, is terrific, because that's exactly the kind of thing a for-profit entity would be able to pay for that a non-profit entity can't, but donors can make it much more, much more uh, effective. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what's the role of government here? I mean, this is one way of reading this, again, East Coast, West Coast, different politics is, Social startups are the libertarian answer to taking care of public problems. Not government, but everybody just get out there and create your own social enterprise, and then we can, we can do it with for-profit and non-profit and leave the third sector out. So how do you think about the role of government? Well, government's critical. I mean, if you look at the organizations that have scaled, government has been a critical component of that scaling process, whether it's enacting something into policy, like we saw with AmeriCorps, or whether it's providing funding um, from health and human services budgets at the local level, for example. If you look at the, the annual budget of the city of New York, it's $22 billion just in one city in, in one year. I mean, there isn't a foundation that is giving away close to that amount of money. And so we need to be thinking from the start of uh, when an organization launches, what is the end game? What, what is the goal? What is the end goal? Just like we would ask in the case of an investment, what's your exit strategy right. for a company? What is your end game and, and how do you anticipate um, bringing this idea to scale? When I noticed from a number of the examples that you cited were great idea that was so great that a government took it on, right? <laughs> and that's frequently, and this is true of, of philanthropy, very frequently the investments that they make are in the hope of demonstrating a really good thing so that government will take it on and be able to do it at scale because the notion of a, of, you know, a handful of foundations being able to, to do something at that kind of scale is, is it's mostly not possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so, which is why the, the sort of, national conversation we're having about sort of, you know, government, like do we want it or not, do we like it or not, should it be sizable or not, is critical. We've, we've stopped thinking of our, of a democracy as really an investment in our collective capacity to solve problems and to do good things. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there is a disconnect between the conversation about sort of people I think of as do-gooders, right? The people who start organizations, the people who are out there trying to solve problems, and government. And we, the, we can't allow the kind of cynical portrayal of government to undercut our capacity to solve problems at scale. We really need to reinvest in remembering that this is a mechanism for really doing huge things. It's the biggest things that we've accomplished uh, as a society have come at this intersection of people mobilizing and government taking on a social good that we've agreed that we need to advance. I'm starting to think about this actually as the collaborative economy. Uh, the uh, Brookings has a new paper out. See, we actually cite other. <laughs> uh, but a great new paper out called The New Localism where they talk about uh, successful cities, successful change really coming from the ability of all three sectors to collaborate, that that, that is the, the key. And many of us have been talking about public-private partnerships for a long time in government and out of government, but this is really where the, everyone expects the others uh, to collaborate and wants to, as opposed to when I was in government, uh, most private sector folks, when we came knocking for public-private partnerships, they knew that what we really meant was we'll come up with the idea and you pay for it 
and they weren't interested. Uh, so every each each one of those has to think about uh, how how to do that. Well, and government, as it, good and as important as it can be, it has a long way to go to learn how to be data driven, for example, or to apply some of the principles that you described to make sure that like you know if you're investing in a program where you expect it to go and what you yeah. expect it to achieve, and to be willing to disinvest in a program if it's not achieving yeah. Yeah. what you intended, which government is also terrible at. Um, and uh, among the most exciting things that I worked on when I, in my time in government that we're trying to replicate a little piece of here has to do with, again, bringing tech thinking to the government table so that um, you can begin to transform um, both the thinking and the design of programs, and you can start using the technology that's changing the way all of us live and work to also drive how government acts and how efficient it is and how well it, it addresses, provides services to the people that it intends to provide. So we've come to expect, you know, to be able to get information or order things or do stuff online that with government processes you're, we're still doing <laughs> on paper. Um, and that's just Lots because of, of paper. Li right? <laughs> and that's just really the failure of these kinds of institutions to be able to adjust and adapt. Well, and I think that's where when we think about scale, government is one way of scaling, um, but technology is a whole new yeah. frontier that really the tech sec the nonprofit sector has just begun to dip its toe into in terms of thinking about scalable solutions using technology. So on that, I've got lots more questions I could ask you, but uh, I, this audience uh, is just as engaged in these questions as we are up here, so I'm gonna turn it over uh, to question and answer. Just wait for the microphone. And please introduce yourself. I don't believe that nobody has a question right here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm Waku. I'm with Accountability Council. Uh, Kathleen is our wonderful board chair. <laughs> we appreciate her every day. Um, but getting so ask her a really hard question. <laughs> <laughs> but getting to the nuts and bolts of this, um, I know that a lot of nonprofit leaders are very busy and also a lot of nonprofits are understaffed. So how do they make, you spoke about trainings, but how do you make the space to even consider changing things? I think probably one reason why a lot of nonprofits are on this kind of continuum of doing the same thing is that they don't have time to think of anything else. Uh, so I would love your insights on that. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good question. <laughs> well, it's been coined the nonprofit starvation cycle, that we don't, we expect and, and even the sector itself has come to expect of itself to do as much as possible and solve these very huge social problems that we're facing using as little money as possible. <laughs> that has to change. That has to be a culture change that we all make, including nonprofit leaders who stay up at all hours of the night doing 10 different jobs because they feel like they can't pay themselves to hire other, or hire other people. Well, and it's, I sit on a couple of foundation boards, and I'm increasingly finding that it's important for philanthropy to think about this, about creating the space for nonprofit leaders to step back to see the broader landscape, to be able to think strategically. I, I'm, I'm In the current moment that we're in, where, which I think of as there are a lot of things that are on fire and a lot of people doing a lot of, a lot of firefighting, firefighting is obviously urgent. You have to do it if it's right in front of you. Um, but there's also a real risk that if you're not able to sort of, you know, get up in the airplane and see the whole landscape, that that you will not be preparing for, you know, other dangers or, or challenges that await you. And one of the roles that philanthropy can play is to be to help leaders, the thinkers who are running these kinds of organizations who are up to really, up, you know, up to their eyebrows in firefighting, have the capacity to step back and think strategically and see the larger landscape. That it's to a certain degree, um, in philanthropy, you have a little bit more capacity to do that yourself, and making that, <laughs> creating that capacity also for the, the people that you fund, I think, is an, especially in moments mm -hmm. like this one, where there, it feels like there is so much for people to address and respond to, is a really vital part of the exercise. So I have a great idea that every time a foundation wants to do a strategic review, the two worst words in the English language, uh, for people like me, instead of doing one, they should pay for one of their grantees to do a strategic review and we'll be set. Uh, there was a question somewhere here. Hi, 
I'm Steve Rickard with Open Society, so, um, uh, and we're very happy to have Cecilia on um, our board. Um, but um, you're in Washington, um, and a lot of the uh, nonprofits here, um, their product is advocacy. And, um, you know, I've started reading the book, which is terrific. Congratulations. Um, have you thought about how your five tools or your five approaches apply to an organization where, you know, their mission is advocacy? You know, what does it mean? Who are the beneficiaries? What are the metrics? What does it mean to test, you know, all of the, the mechanisms that you described? Um, have you, have you <laughs> kind of tried to think through or talk to organizations that do advocacy? Absolutely. I mean, most, most social entrepreneurs who are trying to solve the underlying problems that are causing the problems that they're serving in the first place are doing advocacy work. Um, and all of these strategies that I talk about are challenging when you talk about applying them to advocacy work. Uh, Accountability Council is another great example for you know, the policy change that we want to see in holding international financial institutions accountable will definitely not happen overnight, and it's going to take decades to get to where we would envision um, the world being. And so does that mean that we get to wait for that day to measure our impact? No. We, we have to determine whether we are on track at every step of the way. Um, and you know, for when I went into this research, I thought, well, a lot of this is donor driven, that people are measuring impact and using key performance indicators and all these fancy, fancy data driven tools because they want to satisfy donors. It's not true at all that the best organizations bake this into their DNA because they truly believe that if they are not making impact, then they need to stop what they're doing and change directions. Um, and so that, I think, is hopeful. And so figuring out, yes, it is harder to figure out key performance indicators when you're looking at a transformation over decades, but it's not impossible. And there are strategies that I talk about in the book that will help you get there. Great. Yes, right here in the front. Oh, and then I'll come back to you in the back. <laughs> Ladies, this is truly a pleasure. I don't have any of you on the board, so that's a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Michelle Joseph, and I'm the executive director of the Student Global Ambassador Program. And my question is focused on what we do. We work with STEM sustainability and social justice issues for seventh graders and up. We're trying to infuse um, technology in what we're doing. And with the educational system, because it's so broken, uh, we're having issues with how to do that best uh, so that it's welcome. So the, the kids love it, but we're trying to figure out the next step. And you've touched on that, but I would like to get your take on that, you know, with, with regard to digital natives, how could we get them engaged, but knowing that we're dealing with a broken educational system. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, um, so in social startup success, I, my unit of analysis is the organization. How can organizations be stronger? Because my theory of change personally is that if we can be more effective in developing strong organizations, that we can maximize our resources as a sector. That is not exclusive of also having systems in place so that every organization can achieve their goals. No organization is, is going to be able to achieve their goals without all these other kinds of assumptions. In your case, um, one assumption being true is that you have to have an ec education system that is going to accept new forms of education in order to, in order to be effective. And so part of developing a strong theory of change process is looking at what all the other actors are doing in the sector and figuring out who is in charge of making sure that all of your assumptions actually happen and, and, and become true. Um, and if there's no one filling those gaps, then maybe you need to take a different tack. Um, and that's something that changes regularly, as we saw over the last year, that you can, you can be on track and have everything moving smoothly, and then there's an administration change, and your theory of change might change. <laughs> <laughs> yep. There in the back. 
Hello, my name is Mark Hannis. I'm working on a project called The Orange Book to increase diversity and inclusion in federally appointed positions. And on that note, um, I know School Foundation is looking, it is in the single digits, I believe, the number of women social entrepreneurs who are able to get to mezzanine level size. So we know of the few examples of Wendy Kopp or Natalie, uh, Jacqueline Novogratz, but it's pretty rare to find women social entrepreneurs at maximum scale. And I'm curious, there's a big conversation generally, but with women in the private sector and other places, are what similarities or differences are you seeing vis-a-vis -vis gender and successful social entrepreneurs? Thank you. Well, I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is actually the issue that I think my research has made me most passionate about because there are dozens of stories that I feature in the book of some of the most inspiring change makers um, who are doing incredible work in our society. What keeps me up at night is who got left out of this book. Who is not getting funded because they don't go to a top school or because they are, can call themselves a community organizer, even though maybe what they're doing could be called social entrepreneurship and get funded in another world. Um, or because they are a person of color or a woman and experience implicit bias. Um, and the data, the very little data that exists shows that pr some pretty stark um, disparities. Women founders get funded at a rate of half as much five years out as their male That's counterparts. more than I would have yeah. thought. I would have thought it was a third. The same is true between um, people of color um, and white founders. And when you look at the makeup of foundations, it's pretty clear why that's true. 85% of trustees of, of foundations are white. Three quarters of foundation staff are white. Um, and the idea of starting an organization is a privilege. You have to have resources to be able to say, I'm going to take six months off and test out this idea. Because seed funding doesn't exist. You have to have a proof of concept to get funded. Um, even echoing green. And so I think we need to really think about how we are uh, supporting early stage organizations because we can't build a pipeline of diverse leadership until we start supporting those organizations from day one. Well, and that goes back to Steve's question about advocacy as well. It, that's frequently where women where people of color who were trying to change things get started. And, and I can say this, having done that work for many, many years, it is discounted frequently as having value in some of these other settings, in particular settings um, you know, where, you can, where you can access resources. Mm -hmm. um, and so people kind of making the leap from advocacy to something else um, or to, to something that is recognized beyond an advocacy context is an, it, like a tremendously important point and not enough of us succeed. Got time for one more question because we then have a book signing and I definitely don't want to take time away from that. <laughs> last question. Right here. Oh, well, last two right there. I'll take, we'll take two together and then you all can conclude. Hi, Kat Duffy with Internews. Um, you know, we're a global human rights NGO and one of the things that we are working on globally is trying to connect technologists to policy advocates at sort of nascent internet freedom organizations all over the world in about 30 countries. And one of the big challenges that we're facing is uh, not just the gender divide, but the generational divide. Mm -hmm. That we have extraordinary capacity on the advocacy side, in particular, among you know, human rights activists and advocates who have no understanding of technology, do not want to be bothered, <laughs> right? It is overwhelming. It messes with how they know how to do things. Um, and then we have these you know, really amazing, young, active, vibrant thinkers on the ground who are coming in with sort of technological solutions. But there isn't a great deal of respect on <laughs> either side for the lessons learned, right? I mean, and, and those can be amazing connections yeah. when they're made. And so I was wondering sort of in your research if you have, have been coming up a little bit against that generational divide in terms of thinking about innovation versus practiced management skills, practiced fundraising, practiced strategy, the ability to have the long game and step back, which people who've been doing this for decades sort of bring to the table. And if you've seen any good examples of that really 
working well, or things that I should definitely not do in many, many countries. So hold, like hold the response. On hold on, we're going to take yeah. that last question. I know both of you, right? <laughs> Cecilia's living that day by day. Yeah, exactly. but they're in the aisle in the back, sir. Go ahead, Dan. Hi, Paul and Narcissa with the ARP Foundation. Uh, quick question, how do you define success of a social entrepreneur? Is it just because you're able to raise enough revenue, or is it something to do with sustainability or, or outcomes, or, or uh, struggling with the impact uh, um, around measuring uh, success? So those are two great last questions. Uh, putting I'll take tech and you people take together. Yeah. I'll take the first one. You and you can include yeah, on, on okay. that one. You get a little bit of. <laughs> so the question you raise, we, de we deal with every day in our public interest technology project, which is really about trying to bridge this very one, very gap. And the um, experience that, that a number of us had in the Obama administration with the US Digital Service was that Part of my job was to persuade the policy nerds to sort of accept engineers and product developers at their table. And when it worked, it was because we had a problem in the middle of the table that urgently needed to be solved. And, and everybody's a problem solver. And so when you, if, it, if the conversation was about something, about a problem that needed to be solved, people were willing to drop their barriers and recognize the skill sets that were at the table because they all ultimately contributed. If you were just having a more theoretical or general conversation, then it was really hard to bridge those barriers. So it's, it's the thing we are trying to replicate, and we'll see if we succeed, <laughs> maybe we won't, is that we're trying to create tables where kind of people I think of as doers, people at NGOs, and technologists who are civically minded who want to help change the world are sitting at the table with a problem in front of them um, to begin to iterate on how to, how to solve it. We should talk. We should talk. Uh, I'll just add one little point on that, because my background is in gender equality work, and well, let me tell you, lots of generational <laughs> divides there, as we all know. Um, one strategy that is super effective is two-way mentoring, and 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 creating frameworks for people to learn from each other um, is super powerful. Just framing it in that way and, and, and giving people the tools to ask different questions and frame their interactions in different ways can be really useful. Um, how do I define success? Success, that's a great place to end. <laughs> Every organization has to define their own version of success. You can be an organization, we all know these organizations that are raising a lot of money and having very little impact. <laughs> that, that happens. <laughs> um, hopefully, market market forces prevail, and I'm more worried about the organizations that are having phenomenal impact but don't have the tools to sell their story, to really trace the impact of their work, and to get funded as a result. So my hope is that this book will give people those tools, and that the more that we can think about our role as funders, um, as board members, as volunteers, as helping the capacity of organizations so that they can do a better job uh, of doing the very important work that they do, I think our whole world will be better because of it. I'm not, I'm not going to improve on that. Join me in <laughs> thanking our fabulous panel. <laughs>